You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 118. Being famous is like being drunk, except the whole world is drunk with you. Hervé Villachez. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique Story Mapping System will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, you are in for a treat today. We have screenwriter and director Sasha Gervasi. Now, Sasha's origin story is so amazing I mean, how he got his first script, which was a short film script, and I'll tell you about what that short film script was about first, how he got that to Steven Spielberg, where he he eventually came on as the writer, uh, one of the co-writers of The Terminal, is remarkable. But then how he even got his career started all started with the actor Hervé Villachette who was, for many of you in the audience who's a little bit older, will know him as Tattoo from Fantasy Island, who is essentially the most famous little person in the entire world in the 70s and early 80s. Like, you could not go anywhere in the world without knowing who Hervé was. And his connection with Hervé, which they actually made an entire movie for uh, for HBO called My Dinner with Hervé, which I highly recommend everybody watch. Um, it was just a remarkable, remarkable screenwriting story. Sasha is such an interesting human being. I had such a ball talking with him. He's directed films like Anvil, uh, which is an amazing documentary about a band who never gives up. I, I can't, I can't, I can't. I don't want to give anything else up. And he also directed Hitchcock with Anthony Hopkins. He is a fascinating, fascinating screenwriter. We talk about the business, his origin stories, his craft, what he's doing now, and so much more. And you also will get a bonus episode where I interview Sasha and have a conversation with Bruce Dickinson, who is the lead singer of the legendary band Iron Maiden. And we discuss their new project, Scream for Me, Sarajevo, which is based on an amazing documentary that Bruce was a part of where he went into a war zone to play a concert for the kids in the middle of a war zone, literally bullets flying and so much. And that's a fascinating conversation. And that is on my new show called Next Level Soul. I will be giving you that episode here on Bulletproof Screenwriting, but I If you're interested in more great content like that, uh, you can head to nextlevelsoul.com and we'll discuss more about Next Level Soul uh, in future episodes, but that'll give you a little taste of what I'm doing over there. But let's stop talking. Let's jump into this amazing conversation with Sasha Gervasi. I'd like to welcome to the show Sasha Gervasi, man. How you doing, Sasha? 
I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Uh, I'm I'm excited to talk to you, my friend. We've we've talked a little bit off air already, and it's. Uh, I wish we could we have recorded. Have, we I wish have we stories could. that we frankly cannot put on this podcast. Ob- obviously, for, and for legal, for, legal, <laughs> for legal reasons. So I knew just from those few interactions we've had that this is going to be this is going to be fun. Uh, without question. Um, and you, so I wanted to ask you when we, for, before we start the whole thing, how did you uh, get into this ridiculous business? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Business. I got into it. Well, I was always fascinated with film. I, I went to a school in London called Westminster and I started the film club at Westminster school in about 1980. And my, what I would do is I would go with my housemaster, a guy called Tristan Jones Parry, who was literally a character out of Brideshead Revisited, a brilliant mathematician, completely ill-functioning socially, but really a wonderful man. We would, he would accompany me to Soho, where we would pick up 16-millimeter prints of films. And so I remember bringing to all my classmates, I was 15 or 16 at the time, movies like Don't Look Now and Easy Rider. And so I loved film at school and you know, kind of got into actually getting these 16 mil prints and putting them in the film club. So I think it was a very early dream, but I never thought I'd actually end up working in the film business <laughs> um, because I was for many years you know, a really terrible musician. And I was <laughs> struggling with my own mediocrity for quite a few years, even though I ended up in some bands, you know, that actually did some stuff. But the reality was, I think the real dream was always film. Right. And so ultimately what happened was I was in the music business, got out of the music business. And then I decided I was offered an opportunity to work for uh, a very sort of famous British satirical magazine called Punch. Um, a, a fantastic guy there called Sean McCauley. I called him up. He was the features editor and pitched him a, a, an idea over the phone. I got through to him. His secretary was out to lunch and he gave me my first assignment. And so I started as a journalist and I worked for, worked for Punk, Punch, Punch Magazine and um, Associated Newspapers, Evening Standard, Mail on Sunday. And I would do kind of profiles and interviews with what I thought to be interesting people. I remember in one week in 1993, I think it was, I interviewed um, Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols. Mm-hmm. The lead yeah, that, that, must an, that must have been a hell of an, that must have been a hell of an interview. <laughs> and we met in a, um, an Italian restaurant in Greek Street in Soho and he ended up throwing a chair at me uh, <laughs> because he didn't like, <laughs> he was promoting his book, No Black, No Irish, No Dogs, which was a great book, but he didn't like the sound of my voice and thought I was a tosser. And decided literally to throw some kind of, you know, Art Deco chair in my general direction, which, of course, made it into the interview. Uh, But that same week I interviewed, um, you know, Ted Heath, the former British Conservative Prime Minister, you know, and many, many people along the way. And I just would meet all these fascinating characters. And journalism for me was just, you know, an opportunity to try and make money writing, even though I wasn't really, you know, that wasn't really my end goal. But it was massively fun for me to fly around the world. And I remember my first foreign assignment, I was flown by Associated Newspapers to meet this young prodigy violinist called Sarah Chang in Florence. And I met her. She was 11 and this most brilliant musician who we heard um, perform some exquisite. um, I think it was Vivaldi. I can't remember what, what she was doing at the time. But, you know, she had an entourage, her dad, her cousins, her mothers. There was like 40 adults in the room while I interviewed this 11 year old genius you know, so I had these incredible kind of experiences, just meeting very different types of people. And I think all of that ultimately, as you know, probably, um, if you know a bit of the story, is that, you know, one of the interviews that I was sent to, to do in the summer of 1993 was was to interview Hervé Villachez, who, you know, had been the star of Fantasy Island. And 10, you know, 10 years after he'd been fired by Aaron Spelling was in quite a bad condition. And I was sort of sent to this interview kind of as a joke you know, while I was waiting for, frankly, something more important. So the Gore Vidal interview as it appears in, in the film. And ultimately, that experience changed my life um, and, and led to screenwriting. And I know that sounds very strange, but I was sent um, from London to L.A. to do a series of Im- important show business interviews, as if that really exists as a concept in reality. <laughs> And Herbie Villachez was the kind of a throwaway joke piece, you know. And they said to me, you know, get 500 words with the midget, you know, where are they now? Well, that, so, so that's your, when, because uh, I didn't know, isn't it? That's tattoo, right? Tattoo. Tattoo, yeah. Herbie Villachez, tattoo yeah. on Fancy Island. And yeah, yeah. there'd been Nick Knack in the Bond film, The Man with right. the Gun, sort of a seminal kind of famous kind of cult figure in the 1970s. And frankly, the most uh, famous little person and successful little person act, actor that that had been at all mm-hmm. um 
And, you know, I went in there filled with judgment and cynicism and, you know, fuck, I've got to get through. I've got, this, is the, this is the dregs of the celebrity. I've been given, like, the, you know, the formerly famous dwarf from Fantasy Island. The one hit I, wonder, the one hit wonder almost, yeah. You know, just so I was like, wow, this is really where my career is. You know, I'm interviewing Tattoo. I wanted to shoot myself. But, um, <laughs> well, I won't say it. I won't, anyway, I was going to say something terrible. Um, yeah. But anyway, so we, had, we, we went to meet at Le Petit Chateau in uh, West Hollywood. Um, and I was with this photographer who was sent from the newspaper with me. And his, his name was Sloan Pringle. I mean, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. You can't make that up. Not a stage name, Sloan Pringle. <laughs> and, um, you know, Sloan was like, look, we've got to get to this other place. We have half an hour. Just get your interview in. So, you know, I just went through, what was it like, Fantasy Island, The Man with the Golden Gun, the st stories. And I literally was packing my shit to go away, right, um, to say, you know, thank you, Herve. It's been wonderful. Great stories about Fantasy Island. You know, it was all the, the, the ludicrous yeah. kind of showbizy stuff we knew. And I was putting my stuff and I turned back and Herve had come off his chair and around the corner and was holding a knife at my throat. And I was like, I am about to be shivved to death by, by the tattoo. By, by tattoo. Did, by tattoo is about to kill me. And I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And he wanted to get my attention. He was like, he literally said to me, you wrote the story before you got here. You prejudged me. You have no idea who I really am. You just see me as a joke, you know, on this show. And I'm just like a sort of Sunset Boulevard kind of sad past celebrity. And he was right. He was absolutely right. He wasn't really threatening me with my life. He just wanted to puncture kind of this bubble of judgment and cynicism and disinterest that I kind of clearly walked in with. And he said, if you want to hear the real story of my life, come meet me tomorrow night. So I was so shocked. I was like, <laughs> you know, because my editors had said, look, 500 words, three paragraphs, you know, where are they now? They didn't really. But I, there was something about him that was so fucking compelling, so human and broken and but also interesting. I mean, he was such a charismatic person that I decided to meet him and I ended up spending three days with him. And he told me his life story with such kind of emotional intensity and need. And, you know, as, as I'm sure any other journalist will tell you, when someone tells you the story of their lives, they become quite emotional because how often do you tell all the major emotional events of your life to, to, right. to and, and bad journalists take advantage of it. I actually found him so different to how I imagined him to be. To me, the whole thing was like a lesson about judgment and prejudgment. Because I really did just see him as being defined by his size and being defined by these kind of quote unquote, you know, jokey roles. By the end of the three days, I was so compelled. I went to see him at the, um, the Universal Sheraton where he was staying. And I remember having this really weird feeling, and it's actually recreated in the film My Dinner with Herve. Uh, and we shot the final scene where the actual event had taken place in the same lobby of the Universal Sheraton. 25 years after it had happened. It was just a very weird thing oh, watching God. the Dinklage recreate this scene with, you know, that I'd had with Herve in the same place. And, um, you know, I went up to his room and he had all this fan mail laid out and it was just so sad. You know, it was like, he, he said, they still write to me. And, you know, I just felt, I felt for him, man. I just, yeah. you know, I really connected with him. I felt here's this guy who's been basically totally destroyed by the, the, the cruel fate of, you know, his biology and was totally rejected by his mother and became famous. And of course, none of it really worked, you know, it worked for a time, but it, you know, and, and then of course he lost his mind, blew up his career and was just, but also underneath it was really just a painter. You know, he was really a very talented artist who'd won prizes and gone to, um, you know, some very famous art schools in Paris. And he was the youngest painter, for example, to be exhibited in the Museum of, of Paris. And he was just an extraordinary character. And I really connected with him at the end. And so I remember going back and he had all these photos of his life. And he says, you take these for your article. He looked like 2000 slides of his whole life. And I'm like, thinking to myself, my editors want like maybe one photo. And you know, like, what am I going to do? But I felt like I had to take it. And we went down in the elevator together and then he sort of tugged me on my sleeve and he pulled me into very close to him and he said, he had tears in his eyes and he said, tell them I regret nothing. And I just had this like weird feeling of like, what the fuck is going on? There's, I just knew something was going on. I didn't right. quite know what it was, but it was just so, it like sent a shiver up my spine. 
And I just had this connection with this weirdo that you would never think I would never, why would I connect with this guy? You know, it just, we had nothing in common. And yet we had everything in common. I just was newly sober. He was clearly struggling, you know, during our three days together, he tried, you know, I told him that I was stopped drinking and he was like constantly trying to get me to drink and <laughs> take him to strip clubs. I mean, it was like, he was like the devil and an angel. He was just like, oh just the most complicated, interesting, charismatic and unusual person I think I'd ever met in my life probably to this day and um, I ended up having this bond and anyway so I go home to London and I've got basically 14 hours or 12 hours of these little micro micro cassettes that you used to have you know mm-hmm. where you record it I remember listening back to this th- thing going how the fuck am I gonna put this in an article to take to my editors like you know <laughs> it's really interesting to begin with and then I come back with this anyway so I get a call from Kathy Self, who was his girlfriend, who I'd met during the sort of three-day interview. And Kathy called me at home. It was a Sunday. It was like 6.15 in the evening. Um, Sunday, September the 4th, 1993. I'll never forget it. It was a really pleasant early after, late afternoon evening. And the phone rings. It's Kathy. And Kathy says, Herve committed suicide four and a oh. half hours ago. And I know you will have wanted to let you know that that happened. And just to let you know, Herve really connected with you and is so happy that you have this interview. Oh my God. So I'm like listening back to these tapes now and suddenly I have a whole new perspective. And the perspective is this guy knows that he's going to kill himself. This, this is like some random, you know, English journalist, some young kid who knows nothing has been sent to interview me. I'm just going to grab him and I'm going to give him the whole story about the family, about everything. And it really like was like, you know, what do I do with this? I started crying when I listened to the interview again because I understood that he was absolutely conscious of the fact that he was telling someone his story for the very last time and he was clearly planning to do this. Wow. I, I decided to change my whole perspective on the article and come at it from a point of view of here I was walking in this judgmental, cynical British journalist who knows nothing. And I was just completely captivated by this extraordinary character. And he opened his heart to me. And then, you know, six, five days after we see each other, he kills himself. And so the whole <laughs> article was about. So I do a 5,000 word piece and I take it into my editors at the paper and they were like, this is great. But. This is not what we asked for. We wanted you to go a, do a stupid, funny story. And I was like, but this is the truth. I mean, this is this right. story is important. And luckily, I'd already spoken to someone else who I thought would take the story. And they agreed, OK, we'll take the story uh, and pub- publish it the way you wanted to do it. And I went to my newspaper. I said, you've got to give me front cover and I need, you know, six pages, whatever it is, lots of photos. Here they are, you know, the whole thing. And so I had this extraordinary thing where they basically said, no, we sent you out there. We own the story. You're going to rewrite it. And it was really tough. And I just couldn't really do it at a certain point. And uh, in the end, someone else rewrote the story. It was, I think, four pages or two pages somewhere in the middle of the magazine. And I really felt horrible because here I've had incredibly important personal experience completely out of the blue with this person. I was essentially his suicide note. And here were these guys who were just didn't give a shit. They were just didn't like, get it. to me, summed up everything about British journalism and that and those newsrooms at the time. And the editor literally came out of the room and said, well, Javazi's topped a midget, which means made a midget commit suicide. Where do we send him next? And everyone's laughing. And I'm like, wait, hold on a second. Like this guy is a human being and you guys are just your pigs, you know, mm-hmm. and they're all bitter and they're all just, you know, judgmental and they're not, you know, none of them, they probably wanted to be writers or painters or filmmakers and none of them really were willing to take that risk. And so it's much easier to sit on the sidelines and judge than actually take a risk, you know, and Mm -hmm. do something. And so I just got, that was where the idea for the film was born. And so I'd never written a script before and it leads into my very first script. Well, I wrote a short script, a 32 page screenplay. I've never written one before called My Dinner with Hervé. And I thought, this is great. It's a short about the most famous short man in the world. You know, what I didn't understand is that I'd written essentially an unmakeable $2 million short film that once someone looked at it, they were like, Paris in 1940 and Barbados in San Paolo. Like, who's paying for this? And I was like, yeah, no one's paying. Anyway, um, it became an interesting thing because I wrote this script from the heart to feel like 
I felt like the newspaper robbed me of the truth of that story. And so the script was my first attempt to tell the story from a truthful point of view. And um, I, I, it ended up being read by Steven Spielberg. I mean, that script that I was, you know, got to Spielberg. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You, you mean uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the 32 page, two million dollar yeah. short film about my dinner with Hervé, unmakeable, with unmakeable co- called my di- my my dinner with uh, with Hervé, about the yeah. most famous short man in the world. That script, how yeah. did that 32 page script? Well, that's another story. You see, as as <laughs> <laughs> how did that what happened. Before? So okay, here's the story. This is a crazy story. So I <laughs> had applied to UCLA Film School, and sure. I was really on on the fence about whether I wanted to go. And I got for whatever reason, I got I applied to UCLA. So I was in LA doing all these interviews, Herve and the kids from Beverly Hills 90210. By the way, on mm-hmm. the same trip that I interviewed Herve, you know when he pulled the knife on me, yeah. the interview I was going to was the kids of Beverly Hills 90210. That's who I also interviewed. So mm-hmm. I'm like, all I'm sitting there listening to these imbeciles talking about this terrible show. And all I'm thinking is about tattoo shiving me and what was going to happen next. And I'm like, I was so disinterested. Um, I was a 24 year old. Anyway, so I, it was just so weird. Anyway, so I was, I was basically, um, I, I applied to UCLA because I was in LA so much, and I'd, I went back to the original dream. You know, I was at I was at school, and I started my film club, and I loved film. And you know, I really wanted to see. If, you know, UCLA was a legendary school. You know, that so many fantastic filmmakers, and I was a huge. I am a huge Paul Schrader fan, mm-hmm. and Paul Schrader had been at UCLA and Alexander Coppola. Kane at UCLA Coppola. And, Coppola and just an extraordinary. And, and USC seemed to be like the you know, really successful rich kids. And UCLA was the kind of, you know, messy disaster kids. It felt like, anyway, it was much cheaper. I couldn't yeah. afford to be. So I just applied to UCLA and I got into UCLA. And so I was in LA. My mom said, go to LA. I knew not a single person, not one person. And so my mom had an old friend um, for, called Ruthie uh, Snyder, who she grew up with in Toronto. My mother came from Toronto and then had moved to New York, whatever, and then to England. And, um, she said, look up my old school friend. You know, she hadn't seen her in like 30 years. I was like, great. I'm all hooked up in LA. I have some woman I don't even know. Anyway. So she was very kindly introduced me to her daughter, Fonda, Fonda Snyder. And what happened was I got invited. She said Fonda was running a company called Storyopolis, which was a bookstore in, in, in LA, opposite the Ivy restaurant on Robertson. Mm-hmm. And Paul Allen, the, you know, the Microsoft guy, was funding this kind of children's bookstore. And so she said, oh, we're doing a dinner. Do you want to come? I didn't know her at all. Anyway, so I go to this dinner and I, and I get there early because, you know, I don't know anyone at all. I'm like, you know, I'm talking to the waiters. I'm what year like, are we? What, what year are we talking? It's like 93, two in there, 92, three, four, four, 94 even, right? Something like that. Yeah. And anyway, so I'm in my suit, like, cause I'm very English. I'll put on a suit. They right. can't fool me, whatever. So I go there and I look at, there's these long tables and they're having a dinner to honor the incredible author, Maurice Sendak, who did mm-hmm. Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah. So, and I'm looking at this table and I'm looking at David Geffen, Peter Guber, you know, but like the people coming to this dinner were it's, like, and so Fonda was like laughing because she, she thought I was going to some kind of, you know, like free festival. Mix, some well, mixer. I, I, yeah. I, was, I don't know what I was walking to. So she thought it was very funny. So anyway, so I see all these kind of luminaries. Oliver Stone was at the dinner, I think. And, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. So I'm nervous as hell. Because you should I, be. I'm no one. I have no idea. I'm smoking red Marlboros, like without stopping. I've smoked two packs. Anyway. So I go outside and I'm watching all these Hollywood luminaries through the windows. If you know where, where New Line used to be opposite the Ivy, the Storyopolis was all glass and they had this kind of little area, piazza area with benches. So I'm sitting on the piazza b- benches, watching through the windows as like Oliver Stone and David Geffen and all these people arrive going, what am I doing here? I, can't, I'm, I was thinking about going. Anyway, so this tramp comes up to me who was like wearing some sort of that kind of grungy Seattle look or whatever. And he was sort of a bit befuddled and he sits down and he said, you know, do you have a cigarette? I was like, sure. So I ended up chatting with him 
And we started talking and smoking cigarettes. And he was a very nice guy. And he said, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm English. I'm actually here. I think I'm going to go to film school. And, you know, and he says, really, what, what, what are your plans? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to become a screenwriter. You know, I, I'm going to be a screenwriter like that. And he looks at me and goes, huh. And I literally remember thinking, I looked at him and thought, maybe I can help this guy. Maybe I can just give him, I don't know, some money for the bus or something. I don't mind. I'll help. He seems nice. So anyway, so we're chatting, we're getting on incredibly well and talking about, you know, America versus England and the favorite yeah. TV shows. And I can't remember, but it was great conversation. Mm -hmm. And we're big cigarette smokers. Anyway, so I'm watching the assembled mass through the windows. We both are. And this very beautiful woman comes out and goes up to this tramp. I thought perhaps to give him money. I didn't really know. But she comes up to him and it turns out it's her husband. Okay. And she is coming to this event. And by the way, he is coming to this event. And I'm like, okay, they're letting the homeless in. It's like <laughs> an all open community. I mean, we've got the luminaries, but we're also we're working with the streets. So I, so I was basically just like, okay, so who's – anyway, whatever. So she says, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Sasha Javazzi. I come from London. I'm going to UCLA. I'm going to be a screenwriter. And Elizabeth says, oh, really? That's what – my husband does the tramp and i'm like oh okay so so who are you oh he, he's called steve zalian he had lit oh my god the oscar the previous year for his screenplay for schindler's list so i could not speak oh my I god i have literally met one of the greatest living screenwriters yeah ever forget yeah. it right now then doesn't matter unbelievable and so anyway, we go into the dinner. I'm like freaking out. Elizabeth finds it very funny because I'm like, you're Steve Zanian. Okay, you're Elizabeth Zanian. Okay, great. So then <laughs> I find out that I'm seated like three seats away from him, my card, you know, uh, next to the head of New Life. You know, I, <laughs> anyway, he sees me freaking out and he finds it hilarious. Who's he's, this? He's, Steve? Steve just yeah. found it funny as well. So they're all like laughing at me. And, uh, anyway. So I couldn't speak after that because I felt like I'd behaved like such a dickhead. Like there I am proclaiming I'm a screenwriter and there I am next to the Academy Award winning writer. The, so the equivalent of me, of, 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 of a kid going to Steven Spielberg, you know, one day I'm going to be a, a director, right. <laughs> not knowing that that was Steven Spielberg. I felt like so, I went into a massive shame spiral and I remember just eating all the food and picking out on dessert. I was trying to eat on my feelings it was so i was so nervous i felt terrible i felt like an imposter and i felt like i'd really made a fool of myself in front of essentially i'd never seen him but i'd read all his screenplays i'd read searching for bobby fish or i'd read his uh, awakening script you know uh, the guy uh, was extraordinary i'd, I'd uh, you know I'd, uh, there was so you know serpentine another script of, i mean of, of, of bad yeah. manners whatever these things were you know he was just an extraordinary him and bob town to me with the guys right mm -hmm. so i'm like meeting him made a total fool of his anyway at the end of the dinner he comes over to me and he said here's my phone number if you want to have a coffee let's have a coffee or whatever how and many really, how, how, how 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 many days are you in la at this point once you I've, arrived i haven't been there that long like three weeks <laughs> I've arrived in LA. I know my mother's friend from high school in Toronto and oh I'm meeting God. literally. By the, so anyway, oh so my God. now I had written that my dinner with Herbe script, right? But I didn't know what I was doing, but I had this script. So he said, do you have anything, you know, that I could read? And I said, um, I have this script. And I told him the story of meeting Herbe and he found that story very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so I ended up sending him the script to where, to where, to where he lived in Santa Monica. I sent him the script um, and I didn't hear anything. As you know, yeah. And I was like, okay, I've met Mick Jagger. I've given him my demo tape and I'm a loser. <laughs> and I made a fool of myself. And I offered basically to give him bus money home. I mean, it's just like a full on disaster from start <laughs> to finish. Anyway, so I was in my little hundred dollar a week apartment that I was living in West Hollywood and the phone goes, and this is like three months later. It's Steve's alien. I'm so sorry for not getting back to you. I've been on a project that's finished now. I just happened to get to your script and I think it's really good. Would you like to have coffee? I drive down to Diedrichs in Santa Monica. In fact, my friend Adam dropped me off because I didn't have a car. Because remember, for, well, for the first two, three years in LA, I did not have a car. I was traveling by bus or walking, which was fine, right? Oh, so I was yeah. going to, I got dropped off at Diedrichs. I had a coffee with Steve. And he said, 
I think this is special. I think you're a writer. I think you're right to go to UCLA. And I think this is a very important and special piece of work. And I was just like, Jesus. I've never written anything. This was the first thing I wrote. In, and, and so in the end, without getting into it, because there's lots more, obviously, to chat about, he gave that script to Steven Spielberg. And so mm-hmm. I found myself on the set of Armistad, you know, 10 feet away from Anthony Hopkins, you know, right on the, on the set with, 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 with Steve introduced, because Steve was also working on that, had rewritten that whole thing, was introducing me to Steve, Steven Spielberg. And I just couldn't believe it. And he complimented me on the script and said, would you like to watch? And was could not have been nicer. And ultimately, that ended up, that led to me working with Stephen on the terminal. So it was all through Steve's alien. Like, literally, had I not had that chance meeting with Steve, had Steve not been as cool and generous and so unpretentious and kind with me, he was just extraordinary with me. Extraordinary. Like, you know, in life, when you get people who suddenly appear in a certain moment and they're yeah. like angels, that's yes. exactly what his alien was for me. He was absolutely an angel. I would not like everything that's happened since that moment. I would have absolutely no career without Steve and his belief in me. And, and at times when it was really, really tough, you know, and, so, and I actually, yeah, anyway. So, all right. So you basically had, and I've talked about this a lot is because, I mean, so many screenwriters listening tonight and filmmakers as well who are listening, you, you. You look up to people like, you know, Steve Zalian and, and and Spielberg, and and I I can I consider them to be gods on Mount Hollywood. They're literally like Greek gods in Mount Hollywood. And when one of them decides to come down with the peasants and touches you on the shoulder and is like, "You now shall be a screenwriter. You now shall be a director." That literally happened to you. And and he was and he wasn't even. And the funny thing is, if I if I may go full Greek mythology on you, he was like hidden (laughs) so you he was in disguise almost thank god because i was totally myself i had no idea who he was i didn't (laughs) i was giving this guy cigarettes and possibly giving him bus money home and possibly when i became a screenwriter helping him when i discovered he too was a screenwriter you know oh my god no it was like magic because had i known look i'm very like had i known it was steve's alien i would have probably completely clammed up and not been who i am and so therefore it was a massive gift. It was like such a weird and wonderful thing. And, you know, he and his family and Elizabeth and, and Nick and Charlie would just have been fantastic. Well, I have it's to, amazing, I have, yeah. so I have to ask you because, I mean, and I've spoken to other people on my show as well that have had these kind of magical paths because this is a, this is absolutely lottery ticket. This is magical uh, in so, so many ways. Do you believe in and, and there has to be some sort of fate in this because the chances of this happening, do you oh, believe there are other things that, that kind of guide? Cause I do, I truly do. Like when doors are supposed to open for you, they open for you in a magical way that you just can't understand. You know, how, yeah. I, how I get, how I have had the opportunities to talk to certain people on my show, like yourself and like what's happened to my show, what's happened to my career, all these other different things. When something's supposed to happen, it happens in a way that you will never know. Like, if I would have told you this exact story when you were flying over to LA to, to go to UCLA, you would have said, you're, you're mad. You're mad. If I would have told you that tattoo was going to be the catalyst for your yes. entire career, you would have said, that's right. You're insane. So and also, what, what do you, so what do you, what's your feelings on that? Also with him threatening me with a knife. Obviously. I mean, that's, that's, that's a given. I mean, but the whole, the whole thing I do, well, how can you ignore that? I mean, there's obviously something going on. I'm not saying that goes on for everyone all the time. No. It doesn't go on for me all the time, but I think there are certain critical moments in life when things happen, when you meet someone. And I think it's all about being open and recognizing it because, you know, a lot of the time you don't recognize things. Yeah. So well, but I got very lucky because you know, without getting too much into my personal story, I had a really, you know, a pretty bad time with drugs when I was younger and I, you know, nearly was not here. <laughs> and I think when I got out of that, I was able to figure out, like, actually, I don't really want to, I actually do want to be here. And here are the, and I, when I sort of got clear of that, um, I just saw everything in a strange way as a, as a, as a huge blessing because it's like, you know, 
whenever things would be going badly, you know, I would say to myself, you know, for a dead man, you're not doing that badly. <laughs> you know, I'm alive. I may, and I definitely have that appreciation of life at a very basic level. I don't take stuff for granted. And so I think when you carry that energy, perhaps you invite sometimes positive, perhaps even negative, but, but in this case, a very positive things. Uh, you know, I, I was recently kind of, um, you know, in recovery, clean and sober when I came to LA, like coming to LA was all about a completely new beginning. And mm -hmm. I think when you've been through a tough time, and I'm sure many of your viewers and listeners have been through their own version of that, you know, you know, that there's something about getting through it where you just, you want to live. Yes. <laughs> and that brings stuff to you. And I think that, that maybe that was an example of that. I don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. But I was just, you know, I think when I nearly, you know, when I nearly was not here, it's very humbling. Oh, I think that, you know, like, I think the problem is I see a lot of Hollywood, you know, screenwriters sell their first script for a ton of money and then it all goes to their head, you know, and, and I had that later, I actually have to say, I had to call myself on that, you know, because it does affect you, right? When people start telling you all the shit and you have to really watch it. And um, I would say as a writer, as a writer, particularly in Hollywood, you know, if you don't seek humility, it will find you. <laughs> it will find you. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> You will be fired. You will be, you know, taken down and denigrated and all that stuff. And so, you know, and actually Steve Zayn gave me a great bit of advice. He said, it's a roller coaster. When it when the corner gets squeaky, squeeze on tight. Just hold on, you know. And I think that I've always done that. There have been some terrible, terrible moments as well as some extraordinary moments. And I think that, um, you know, it is about not being a wanker. <laughs> If you can. And, being, and being, you know, when people, when people like that, like I think what happens is you get these moments of grace and clearly that was some kind of a miracle with Steve. You know, it's when the ego cuts in and it starts taking credit for all that shit, you get into a lot of trouble. So you have to just mm. count your blessings and go, thank you, rather than start making it about you. And that is something that, you know, we're all prone to at different times. But you've got to watch for that. And I, I've certainly... If I haven't been watching for it, I've learned the lesson the hard way. I, I mean, the ego is the, I mean, listen, the ego is one of the, the, the thing that we all fight every single day. And I believe in the, in the film industry more so than ever, because man, it is so, it, it is and so I mean, enticing. Like, oh, a screenwriter having an ego is kind of like, you know, that knight in the Monty Python. <laughs> He gets his arm knocked off and then his leg. It's just a flesh so wound. It's really a flesh wound. And then he's like a quivering stump. You know, that's like a, a screenwriter with an ego. Come here. Come here. I'll take you. <laughs> it's like, you know, you better not, you know, it's just a waste of your energy. You just better get real and take your breaks when you get them and, and pass it on. That's the key thing. Yes. Like if people come into your path and you feel, even if you can make it like a tiny difference, don't, you know, you know, don't delude yourself into thinking you could do what someone like Steve Zalian or Steven Spielberg could do. But if you can actually help someone, even if it's reading a script or listening or whatever, you know, do it, man, because you got given that times 10. And I think it's in a strange way, it's, it's your duty to do that. It's the pay it forward. It's that's the pay what forward. was done for you. You know, so uh, that's, I just think if you're coming from basically a place of, honesty and fairness and trying not to be a tosser, trying not to be and catching yourself when you are, mm -hmm. then, you know, you're going to be all right. You're going to go, you're going to survive the crazy turns of the roller coaster and the ups and downs and the rapids in the river. And there will be plenty as I'm sure, you know, most of your, you know, writers know it's just very, you know, it, and you can go from the hottest thing to the coldest and the hot, you know, and it's like, try not to pay attention to the temperature reading, focus on the process <laughs> and the long-term plan because, you know, Today's hottest screenwriter is tomorrow's coldest. I've, I've, got, I've got the best reviews and the very worst. You know, it's like you'll have all of it. Try not to get buy into it too much. I think just focus on, okay, I've got to deliver this script and I've got to deliver this movie or whatever. Stay in what at, you do, you know, and don't worry and, about the other bullshit. And look at Hervé. I mean, look, I mean, he was the hottest, biggest thing. Totally. In, in, yeah. I mean, in the 70s, you couldn't – you just couldn't he was everywhere i mean he, he was he he was so hot and look where he and, and, and that's ends the, up. that was the lesson of the herve story and yeah. it all went to head and he got into it with ricardo montalban and he wanted a trailer as big and and basically spelling fired him because he was completely out of you know out of control and you know he, he was destroyed he went from you know a, a tv star 
on an ABC show getting thirty or forty thousand dollars a week in 1979, 80, 81. Jesus right? Christ, yeah. Um, to, you know, <laughs> when I found him having to flush his toilet by taking water out of his swimming pool to flush the toilet because the water had been cut off. You know, it was really extreme. So yeah, he yeah. was a kind of example to me. You know, and I also felt for him because there was clearly he'd realized that he'd kind of completely fucked himself, you know, Jesus. and his ego, you know, his ego was not his amigo, as they say, you know. It's, <laughs> well, I like that. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It blew everything up. So anyway, yeah, I mean, there, are, there are so many examples of that, you know, of um, just don't take the work seriously. Just don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah. Now, so let me ask. All right, so you're working with Steve and Steve, the Steves, um, on on Terminal. Um, what is that like? Did Steve bring you in? I think he, it it almost sounds like he Donnie Brasco'd you. He's like he's a good fella. He can come in with me. So he kind of like vouched for you. You walked in, and Steve's like, "I want to work with you on the Terminal." Is how did that? How did you? First of all, how do you collaborate with? Really, him? Well, it was Walter Parks, really, who I work with mostly. Walter okay. Parks, who was then running DreamWorks, also a brilliant producer who we developed the script together. And then initially what happened was that um, Tom, Tom Hanks came into it. I'm just thinking my first meeting with Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks said he would like to do the script. And then I went to meet him at his office in Santa Monica. And it was, it was unbelievable. It was hilarious. Well, what, and, happened? Uh, what, what, what happened when you well, met Tom just, Hanks? Just, but I can't remember. I think I had, I said, I've got to do something really notable. I'll come up with a joke. So I think I came into his office and Walter Park said, and here's Tom Hanks. And I looked at Tom and I looked at Walter and I said, but you said Tom Hulse. <laughs> and, then Tom was like... <laughs> and then he laughed his head off and then we became friends. Oh my so God. We... Oh my God. That's, ama- but, that's so I, so I amazing. That's amazing. I want a notable entry. Um, and it was hilarious. So we ended up having a good time and I ended up being high. So anyway, so he came on to Terminal. He s- wanted to do it. And then originally actually Sam Mendes was going to direct the film. And I met with Sam and Sam was like, don't change a word of the script. Um, and then it sort of all went quiet and it was really weird. I was on a research trip with Tom Hanks in Europe and we were working on this other project that unfortunately never got made. It was called Comrade Rockstar. It was a great project and Tom was very into it at the time. And so we flew, um, on, on the DreamWorks jet, which was also another. Of course. Mind. Why wouldn't so I went, you? <laughs> I went with Tom and Walter and we went to, uh, we went to Berlin to do research and meet various people to do with the Comrade Rockstar story. And we were staying at the Adlon Hotel in Berlin. And, you know, at this point, I didn't know what was happening with Terminal. I knew Tom was interested in it. I knew we were developing this other thing. And so Tom was on the Catch Me If You Can, you know, press junket tour. And I remember I got a call. Um, Tom's driver or whatever called and said, you know, that there's a car downstairs, you know, go and have dinner with Tom, right? So... I got into the car and I go into this restaurant in Berlin, which I think was called Von or Vau. I can't remember. It was this big room with like a gallery and like a main floor. And there was this table of like 20 people. And there was an empty chair at the end. And there was Walter Parks, Leonardo DiCaprio, Ethan Suppley, you know, Tom Hanks or whatever. And then there was a guy not facing me just that. Anyway, so I walked in and Tom was with Stephen. And Tom said, Sasha, you know, Stephen, Sasha's here. And Steven Spielberg turned around to me and he said, congratulations, we shoot November the 5th. And I was like, what? What are we doing? What, what, are, we, what's, what are we shooting? What are we shooting? <laughs> His moment where he said, I'm, I'm going to direct the terminal. And I just was like, they were all, again, they were all laughing at me because I was just like so... I, I feel that I hear a theme here that when I, I hear a theme here, Sasha, that when when these giants, when the gods, when the gods get together and they see the and they see the, the commoners walking among us, they they like to poke fun at them, essentially, is what I hear. <laughs> well, it was the same thing with, with, with Tom Hanks. It was the sweetest of all of the people. Right, right. All the act- so, in fact, when Tom Hanks told me he was going to attach himself to the script, mm-hmm. he said, I was at his office, he said, will you drive me home? I said, sure. I didn't really know. I thought maybe he couldn't afford Uber. I didn't really understand. Yeah, don't give him, don't give him, look, don't give him change for the bus like you were going to do, thought, Steve. <laughs> so I gave some bus tickets to Zalian, and then I thought, I'll help him with some vouchers. <laughs> anyway, so I'm driving. <laughs> so, oh so this is a true story. So the, 
mirror stories that is I'm driving with Tommy's in the passenger seat. I'm driving my, you know, very excited. I've sold my first script and I've, of course, got a Cadillac because I'm an idiot. I'm <laughs> finding that amusing. I, he said, why did you, you're from Britain? Why did you lease a Cadillac? And I said, because I'm from Britain, you know. And so anyway, <laughs> I'm driving along and he says, um, I'm just going to hold the steering wheel for just a minute. And I said, sure. Do you? Okay. So he holds the wheel and he turns to me and he says, I'm going to star in Terminal. And I was like, because <laughs> he knew I was going to have a moment. And so he held the wheel. So Tom did that. And then we had the, 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 the when Steven Spielberg told me he was directing the film in Berlin. So it was quite, you know, you got to understand, this is my second movie. So I've done a small hairdressing comedy called The Big Tease at Warner Brothers that no one saw, which we made for $4 million. And then, you know, suddenly I'm doing a Spielberg Hanks movie, number right. two. Right. So it was like complete madness. Oh, my God. And I, but I have to ask you, because I, I told you off air, I absolutely adore The Terminal. I adore it. I, my wife and I watch it every few years because everyone's, you know, between the story and the characters and, of course, Hanks' performance and – um, and st in Steven's direction. I mean, how did that story come together? Like, it's based on a real story, right? It's based on a true story called um, Alfred Nasseri, who lived for many years at, at Paris Airport, Charles de Gaulle. He was an Iranian dissident. It was a wow. true story. An Iranian dissident who had escaped, who, who'd escaped into, uh, into France illegally and came back to go to his home country. They discovered that he, was, he would probably be imprisoned or executed if he got on the plane back to Tehran. And so, but at the same time, he'd illegally been in France, so they wouldn't let him back out. And they said, just wait in the terminal a minute. So that was a whole story with, you know, a lot of political com complexity. And it was about many things. And we decided, well, look, let's just take the scenario of the man stuck in the airport based on the true story. And let's do something slightly different. So that became, you know, Victor Navorsky and Krakosia and all of that stuff that was in the film. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, it's great because that, I mean, that, people love that movie, you know, it's, it's, and, it, and it sort of, it, it sort of, you know, what <laughs> some people loved it initially, not everyone, but over the years, it's oh. become this kind of, it has its own life. And in England, I started to realize it's become a Christmas film on the BBC, like five years ago, like it either plays Christmas Eve or Christmas Day on BBC One or BBC, you know, it's sort of a bit of a tradition now. I didn't really realize that, um, but it's obviously great to be part of something like that. Um, and you know, it was an extraordinary experience having this film made by obviously some of the greatest people, people I'd studied at film school and then, you know, six <laughs> months I'm working with them. Um, yeah, no, it was, I wouldn't listen without those guys. And Spielberg was just, a, a, he was extraordinary with me, incredibly generous. And, um, it was hard, you know, when this is happening to you, you don't really understand what's happening and you, right. kind of, you don't handle it brilliantly. I didn't really... <clears throat> It was. It's only like now, years later, that you really understand. My God, Steven Spielberg decided to make your movie. Wow. You know, I kind of knew it at the time, um, but I really know now, and I really feel grateful to to Steven and to Tom and to Walter and, and to Steve Zalian for really creating that whole scenario. So, you it, know, I'm lucky. I mean, lucky. I mean, I can only imagine reading a textbook with Steven Spielberg in it, and then a few months later. <laughs> We're like, or, or a year later working with him. It, it, I can't even, I can't even comprehend that. Um, now you, you, you are, are not just a screenwriter. You're also a director. How did you make the jump from screenwriting to directing? Well, I just decided that I was going to direct something. I wanted to be a director always. And then I thought, you know, because what happened after Terminal was that I got offered lots of kind of big studio comedy rewrites and stuff, right. you know, and I thought, I obviously had this incredible experience, but I didn't really want to be, you know, just doing big assignments all the time. I really wanted to see if I could be a filmmaker and to, you know, have a go. So I realized no one was really going to give me a chance. Uh, and I realized that I'd have to, you know, think it, think it through on my own. I knew this band. And that will tie, tie into what we, what we talk about later with our mystery special guest. Yes. I, I knew this band when I was 15. Um, called Anvil, a Canadian heavy metal band. And I yeah. met them when I was 15 at the Marquee Club in London uh, in 1982. And I got into the dressing room and I ended up talking to them. They'd never been to London before. They were my heroes. I, I said, have you been here? They said, no. I said, I'll give you a tour of London. I ended up taking Anvil, you know, the band behind Metal on Metal, 
and <laughs> and uh, you know strength of steel and hard and heavy. Um, I ended up taking them on a tour of the Houses of Parliament, the Tate Gallery, and I took them back home to meet my mother. You can imagine my mother's how thrilled she was when she opens the door to find me with the four members of Andal. 15, who were 15 year old, 15, 15 year old. with posters on the wall of that band. She was completely, she said, you've got 10 minutes, get them out of here. Anyway, so I, I introduced them to my mom. Anyway, they would find me quite entertaining and I found them entertaining. They said, look, what are you doing next summer? I said, well, I'm on school holiday. Do you want to come on the road with us? Rob Reiner, the drummer of Anvil was named Rob Reiner, like as in the director of Spinal Tap. You couldn't, again, make that shit up. And uh, Rob said, would you like to be my drum tech on this tour? So I, following summer, I lied to my mom. She was never letting me go on tour with Anvil. I told my dad they were split up. He lived in New York. I, I said, I'm going to spend the summer with my dad. Went to my dad and I said, I'm going on tour with this heavy metal band. Will you meet them to make, give me your blessing? And my father had you know, taught economics at Oxford. So you know, the Anvil was not his core demographic band. And uh, they met and he was, you know, he gave them a talking to and said, protect my son. But he gave me the go ahead to go on tour. And we went on a tour of Canadian hockey arenas in the summer of uh, 1984. And I learned how to play drums from the drummer of Anvil, Rob Reiner, on that tour and had, you know, an incredible experience. I was just really young. Um, yeah, 80, I went on three tours, I think, 83, four and five or four, five and six. I can't remember. But I was a, you know, a drum roadie. I was a roadie. So I met those guys and I love them. And I remember this young guy, this young Danish tennis uh, prodigy or prodigy or player called Lars Ulrich, who was around my age, who was around at the time an Anvil fan and Scott Ian, who later went on to be Anthrax. And basically 20 years passed, I lost touch with Anvil. And then I realized that, you know, all the bands they'd influenced, you know, Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth or whatever, they'd all become mega bands. And Anvil had disappeared. I went online. I figured out what was happening. Um, and I figured out that they were playing like pub gigs in like Northern Ontario. They were still going after 30 years. And I was like, why are you still going? So I wrote to the lead singer whose name is Lips. And I said, come to California. Lips flew out. He was wearing exactly the same Scorpions t-shirt he'd been wearing last time I'd seen him in 1987. He was like frozen in time. And he was going, my band's going to make it, man. It's going to be great. We're going to do it. And I was like, thinking to myself, he is completely mental. Like, what is he talking about? It's right. over, right? But there was something so infectious. And actually, I took him to see Steve Zalian, my mentor, that weekend when he was in LA. And, and I'm sitting there with Steve making coffee, and we're looking out as, as Lips is talking to Steve's wife, Elizabeth, and he's saying, who the hell is this guy? And I told him the whole story. And he said, there's a movie there. There's a movie about friendship and not giving up on your dream, and it's bittersweet, and you should direct it. And I said, wow. And I did. And it became Anvil. <laughs> so it was, and it was one of those- Anvil, like, the story of Anvil. <laughs> the story of Anvil. And I just rolled the dice. No one was going to pay for it. I financed it myself. And I, within, I think, 12 weeks of that encounter with Steve down at the beach with Lips, I was in Northern Romania shooting Anvil on one of the worst tours that you've ever, have you seen the film? I mean, it was a, a beyond a disaster. Oh my God. You know, uh, and so that, and that movie then, you know, became my directorial debut, which then came into Sundance and, you know, uh, still to this day, actually, you know, people love that movie, uh, because it really is about not giving up and it really is about, you know, doing something for the right reasons and passion and, you know, all of that stuff. Absolutely remarkable. So, so that documentary, which has become a cult phenomenon, <laughs> people love that movie. And you yep. were telling me like, everyone says it's your best work ever. Well, people love that film. It's so, well, it's also done from a place of total naivety, <laughs> innocence, and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just following a feeling. And I think the film captures that, mm -hmm. the essence of it. And it just has traveled so far and wide. And it was like an amazing story because here was this band, the, the movie in one sense is essentially a portrait in failure. Right. And yet every band loves this film. And in fact, ACDC were doing a stadium tour and invited Anvil to open for them. And I remember standing on the side of the stage with Anvil, a giant stadium, and 50,000 people are shouting, Anvil, Anvil, Anvil. And it was just like, you never know what's going to happen. You just never know. Like, we had no idea that any of that stuff, we had no idea that, you know, that they went to the Total Rock Awards. You know, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin <laughs> came up with Anvil to thank them for inspiring him to keep doing what he's doing. And it's like, you know, it was just like we were at the Bowery Hotel in New York and I was Jesus. with Anvil 
And I was, and 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 and, and, and Lips is smoking a cigarette on the terrace of the bar, and he comes out. He said, "There's this really interesting guy and another guy." And they really like the movie, and I don't know who they are. Maybe you could go talk to them for me. I, I'd like to know more about them. Anyway, so I go out with Lips, and it's Chris Martin of Coldplay and Jay Z, and they're talking to Lips about <laughs> Andal. And I'm like, he had, they had no idea. They had no idea who oh. anyone. They live in this. They live in this it, '80s b- like bubble. Was, yeah, I mean, at the premiere uh, in Hollywood, we did the premiere at the Egyptian Theatre. Dustin yeah. Hoffman came to the premiere, mm-hmm. and. Um, He's in tears after the movie, coming up to Lips and Rob. And Rob's like, has no idea who he is. And then after about 10 minutes, he, he turns to me and he goes, is that the guy from Papillon? <laughs> <laughs> it is yes. the guy from Papillon. Papillon. So that's what was wonderful about them, is they just live in their own magical world. But were it not for that, there would have been no movie to make about. you know. And that no. movie, I think, has turned into, has inspired you know, other bands and Certainly a lot of other movies about bands. Oh, my and emotional. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So then, okay, so from story from, from, from Anvil, I love the title, Anvil, the story of Anvil, which is such a great title. Um, so once that happens, that's a documentary. Uh, but yeah. then, you're, then you're thrown into more narrative work. And one of the films you worked on um, was Hitchcock, which. Yeah, well, that's that, but it's all to do with Anvil. Right. Because, and so, like, how did Anvil get you Hitchcock? So what happened was that Tom Pollock, who was another angel of mine, who had run Universal from 85 to 95, incredible guy. And he was partners with Ivan Reitman and they had Montecito pictures and they financed and they did, you know, and they, they were fantastic. You know, they, they, um, they just supported young filmmakers. I actually got a, my first fan letter about Anvil was from Tom Pollock, who saw the film and said, this makes the old guys think they can keep going and I want to meet you. Anyway, so they had this assignment for Hitchcock. And I was like, okay, I'm fast. I mean, obviously Hitchcock, I'm fascinated with the subject. I thought it it was based on this thing that Hitchcock and the making of Psycho. I thought the book was brilliant. And I was just like, so I thought, okay, I'll, you know, my agent said, well, just go in and meet Tom Pollock. He likes your movie Anvil. And then the meeting began with, it's lovely to meet you. We love Anvil. You're not going to get this job. But anyway, let's have it's nice we just, to meet. We just wanted to meet you. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, you know, when someone says something's not going to happen, you're just like, fuck it. Okay, whatever. So I just, I said, this has got to be about Alma and, you know, the, un, the unknown force behind Hitch. And it's got to be fun and irreverent and tongue in cheek, hopefully. And it's, you know, it's only a movie, you know, like don't take it too seriously. It's meant to be sort of droll in the way that Hitchcock was. So I pitched them this. Anyway, they were like, well, this is great, but, you know, Anthony Hopkins, pretty major actor, you know, probably he, you're not going to get past him. Anyway, he was a massive Anvil fan. <laughs> I had no idea. What? Anvil <laughs> Hopkins was an Anvil fan. That's what I'm fucking Anvil Oh, like, my it, God. How, it just goes to show, like, the oh Hermes Anvil thing. You're coming from a place of you're doing it for your own fucking reasons. Fuck everyone else. And somehow oh that traveled. So Tony was like, let's do the film. And then Helen was like, love it. Need a bit more of the hour. So I did some work on the script. Um, you know, it was John McLaughlin's script, but I did do a little work on the Alma role. And um, yeah, and then the movie came together and Searchlight made the film. So, you know, it was, uh, and then I got Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> I did have this weird moment where I was in rehearsals with with Anthony Hopkins and Helen Mirren, and I was like, I can't believe I'm actually in that. I can't believe they're talking to me, let alone like you know listening to a potential suggestion. Anyway, it was I learned so much. I mean, you can imagine like working with those people and Scarlett Johansson and Jeff Cronenworth and the incredible Pam Martin who cut the fighter was cutting the movie and working with Searchlight. I mean, it was an extraordinary learning experience. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you just says like I can't believe. I think if there's a biography about you ever, it's going to be called I can't believe. I, I just can't believe this is happening, because it's it, from everything you've told me. There's just been one amazing event to another, and, and I know. Look, I know you're, these are the highlights, and I know there's been ups and downs throughout, like anybody's life. Yeah. But again, just like Hervé, just like Steve Zellian, and then. And then you're like, oh, you're never going to get past Anthony Hopkins. He goes, oh, I saw your documentary. I'm a huge fan. I've like, seen it three times. Yeah, like, I mean, it's like, what is the ch- what are the chances that the legendary Anthony Hopkins would be a fan of a of a of a basically a failed metal band from the '80s, 
that you happen to make a documentary about because you have, by the way, happen to be well, I mean, the I roadie. The, the thing that people should take from all of this <laughs> is that deep down, no, the thing that people should take from all this is that deep down inside, yeah. Anthony Hopkins feels like a failed metal band from the 80s. You know, we all <laughs> have this feeling, you know, of like, it's a human, right? We all, you know, we're always on ourselves and we're mo- more critical of ourselves than perhaps anyone else is. And it's, you know, so it was just, it was very truthful. You know, it was about flawed human beings who are trying their best who don't actually necessarily succeed. And I'd say of all the people I've met who, some of whom are massive successes, they don't necessarily think about, think like that or feel that. They often just carry the wounds of the failures with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah. You know, strangely, it's just a weird thing that I've observed. I don't know if it's true, but um, I think that that's sometimes true. So, you know, some of the greatest successes feel like failures. Oh, they no. Really- I mean, I could get a thousand good reviews but I'll focus on the one bad review. And of that's, course. it's just, it's, it's human nature. And it's so overwhelming because you're looking, yeah. you've obviously been giving literally a thousand reviews that are fantastic, but there's that one guy or gal who just like, you know what? Terminal. Yeah. Eh. But then there's a thousand other ones that are just like. A great oh. terminal review. No, there's a great, there was a great <laughs> terminal review in an English newspaper. I can't forget it. It's a terrible review. Yeah. They said something like watching this film was like standing in a waterfall of vomit and treacle. Oh, my God. What a visual. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, That's okay. Brilliant. But what I'm saying is you remember, I just remember that. I don't remember anything else apart from that, like at the worst kind of shiv. You know, and I, I don't know, maybe that's just human nature. I was I was talking to Troy Duffy, um, the, the famous director from uh, Boondock Saints. Sure. Um, that whole... Uh, it's legendary documentary. Legendary documentary um, as well. And he told me, he's like, there was this one review. <laughs> and he goes, by the LA Times, I think. It was so brilliantly written that yeah. if you're going to get smashed by someone, at least let it be a really good writer because it was entertaining. Yeah, yeah. It was world-class <laughs> beating. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have to deal with that, man. You're going to have to deal with getting shivved in every part of your body <laughs> by someone. At some point, you're going to have a knife sticking out of you. But, you know, you've got to kind of also ignore it. It's like, nice. you know, having been also having been a reviewer myself and having been a journalist, I really do understand what's on the other side of that. You know, um, a lot of those people are blocked creatives. They're blocked filmmakers who aren't able to actually do it themselves for whatever reasons. Either they don't have the talent or the courage or both or whatever, or it just hasn't happened. You know, so, uh, you know, so it's they're, they're kind of bitter slightly, uh, some of them. And others are really constructive and they use the criticism to try and say, actually, here's how you could have done a better job. And here's, you know, and you can actually learn from a great review. You learn a ton of shit. So it's it's important to be aware of them and look for the stuff that you can learn from rather than taking any of it too seriously. Because when it gets like nasty, you know, the person's got like an axe to grind. Like, you know, people have a they, they've got an agenda that's not really about, you know, like sometimes you read a review of something and you go, and you've seen the film and you go, they obviously did not see the same film. In fact, they watched the film. They just had, this was their, this was, this is a review based on the idea of what they wanted it to be. And right. what I would say is, you know, then go make your film. You know what I mean? But everyone's entitled to be creative in their own way. Um, anyway, so it's, you, you can learn though. For I think you can learn. Oh, no, that. absolutely. I mean, I mean, Roger. Or, or by highly entertained by the, you know, standing in a waterfall of treacle and vomit, which is. I mean. I mean, that's amazing. But like Roger Ebert literally got the Pulitzer for his criticism, his film criticism. And he's he's one of those. And he loved filmmakers. He loved filmmakers. And I have a Roger Ebert story. I'll tell you off air afterwards that when he he was kind to a short film yeah. of mine. Well, I mean, for example, when we had when we had Anvil, right, yeah. you know, we didn't know how anyone if anyone was even going to see it, let alone review right. it. And it was incredible. I got the New Yorker one week and we had two and a half pages from Anthony Lane, who's one of oh the God. greatest reviewers. And he said, this is all about mortality and aging. And this is the, the ravages of time. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I would know, but what I'm saying Amazing. is in the circumstance, people will get stuff from it that you didn't even intend. You yeah. Know, that you, 
do something for a pure point of view, for, you know, you do something for, for an emotional point of view or you want to tell a certain story. And if there's something pure about it, people will bring in their own interpretations, which you had no idea, you know. Yeah. So I, I feel lucky when that happens and it has a couple of times and I feel good about it and the other stuff you learn from. Now, okay, I wanted to touch on something really quick with you because you've, I mean, you've obviously played, you know, you've, you've roamed in circles with, you know, legendary filmmakers and you've worked with studios and, and you've worked inside the machine. Can you touch a little bit about the politics of working and navigating those waters? Because I would say what I've, what I've learned is very simple is listen to everyone. Um, executives, producers uh, go crazy if they feel they have not been heard. You know, I, I just think that when, when you're in a, a development meeting, a, a writer or a director shuts an idea down without entertaining it, that person gets really mad. And look, to be fair, those people are considering giving you millions of dollars to go off and make your dream come true and tell your story. You know, the least you could do is at least listen to them. It doesn't mean you have to take their suggestion, but at least be civil and at least do that. And I see a lot of people get into problems where they're just like, that guy's an idiot. You know, he's also writing you a check for $10 million. <laughs> How about listening to that part of it? You know, so, but there are some techniques when you do have someone in the creative mix, who's absolutely stupid. You just keep that to yourself. First of all, you don't say anything. And then you can do something called IOI, which is a technique I use. Have you heard of IOI? I have not. Okay. It's uh, it's a term called, it's, it stands for the illusion of inclusion where what you do is you listen to their absolutely stupid idea and you pretend to entertain. <laughs> you go, that, that's a great, I'm going to try that, you know, knowing that it's dumb. And you just let them feel that they've been considered and that their thoughts have been entertained. So that's, but just be nice to everyone, even if it's like, this should take place on a skateboard on the moon, you know, just go, okay, you know, let's, let's see what we can do with that. You know, so I just think it's best to be polite and uh, use the IOI technique if in doubt, because, you know, there's nothing worse than a frustrated filmmaker who wants you to do something and who is not a filmmaker, but who's an executive or a producer or, you know, someone who everyone just wants to be heard. So that's one thing I would do is listen to everyone. Right. And even if you disagree, just be politic. Just don't tell people they're idiots. People do not like to hear that they're idiots. And by the way, and, and, and you might, and this is something I've seen throughout my, my, you know, being a student of the industry for the last 20 odd years yeah. is that there might be a moment where you have the power and you are hot and, and you have the power to crush somebody, yeah. but that power generally doesn't hang forever. And there will be a moment where you go down. I mean, even Steven Spielberg, I mean, I remember 91 when Hook came out, everyone's like, it's over. It's over. He's yeah. done. He's done. He's done. And Hook, by the way, is still one of my favorite. I love Hook. But it didn't do well. And he's like, oh, he's he's washed up. He's not. This. And then eh, yeah. Jurassic Park and Schindler's List, same year. Schindler's List in the same year. But, you know, I'm <laughs> sure he probably took that as like, well, screw these guys. I'll show them. You know, sometimes <laughs> being knocked down. No, but really. It yeah, you're right. Defense. It's like anger is a powerful emotion. Mm. If you could direct it in the right way, you know, it, it, it's like it's a very powerful thing. You know, I think when I directed Anvil, I was like, I got something to prove, man. I, you know, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Like, I'm just doing it. Right. And I think that so use it like whatever your cards are, even if they're shit, use the power. Uh, of, of, of what they give you, even if it is disappointment, anger, frustration, people, listen, people write you off all the time, all the time. And they take delight in it. You know, mm -hmm. there's nothing in Hollywood than the schadenfreude aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Luckily I hang out with a group of filmmakers who are extremely supportive of one another. Like for example, Alexander Payne, you know, whoever it is, you know, we, we read each other's scripts, we're supported, you know, we give each other notes and thoughts and stuff. I try and support all other filmmakers. You know, um, because it's so hard. Oh my so, God. So you want to support, you know, sitting in judgment and kind of belittling people and trying to, you know, it's just not, it's just not the way to live because if, if that's what you put out, that's obviously what you're going to get back. If you put out support, genuine help and generosity, that's what comes back to you. Amen. It's, it's very, very simple. So it's really maths. It's physics actually just you know, be smart about it. And the people who are hot and take advantage and, 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 you know, put people down and, and, you know, act like they're hot shit, you know, um, guess what? It ain't going to last. And there, you will come a time when you want people, when you're down to be supportive of you. And because you were such an asshole when you were hot, 
they won't do that. You've, I'm, there's many careers where people were so unpleasant as, as they went up that, that, that when they got hit, no one wanted to help. The yeah. knives come out, you know, endless executives, studio heads, oh, filmmakers. I mean- no. So just, uh, you know, what is it that a, 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 a wise man learns from his own mistakes, a genius learns from the mistakes of others? You know, just look around, because if you just learn from what other people do, you know, you, you know, just take that information. Take it. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests because I know I could talk to you for about another hour and I might actually with our mystery guest in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but um, a few questions I ask all my guests. What are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Well, for me, I would absolutely say the Chinatown. Yeah. I would absolutely say that Steve Zalian's shooting script of, of Schindler's List is extraordinary. Um, oh God, there are so many. The Godfather. Yeah, of course. Unbelievable. Of course. The Graduate script is incredible. Oh, what a great movie. Sunset Boulevard is incredible. Um, you know, even I, I read recently, again, the original Magnificent Seven script. Mm-hmm. Is extremely, you know, so those are the kind of scripts that were, and, an, and a useful technique if you're blocked as a writer, which I've been many, many times. They nearly threw me out of UCLA at the end of the first year because I didn't finish a script. I started three and finished none. A great thing is take a great script like it's Chinatown and begin typing it out, as in copying it out. So when I've had a block, I'll take a Rob Town script, a Robert Town script, or a Steve Zaling script, or a Scott Frank script, depending on, you know, and I'll sit down, and I'll begin typing it out. You unblock maybe because when you've like got nine pages into Chinatown, and you, it's that something just by the proximity, the engagement with the energy of that kind of intellect and, and ferocious kind of interesting. Brilliant, it just somehow could just push your block. So it's a technique I just discovered by accident because I was so frustrated and I actually started writing Schindler's List. If you actually go and copy a script out, it is great for unblocking. That's what I found. What I found yeah. when I when I'm writing, one of the things I found as well is like when I get blocked in in something, I'll actually just go back to the beginning, and just yes. start reading, and just that sure. process of going. It's kind of like getting the, yeah. it's kind of getting the momentum going. So as you're but, reading, yeah. you, then it just kind of and then you. But, but, but therein, there's a potential trap there, Alex, which yes. is. You can also have people who spend 10 years polishing the first 30 pages. It's important to write a comp- – I learned this lesson. You've got to write a complete bad script first. Just yes. get to the end, even if it's total shit, because it's much harder to go from nothing to something mm-hmm. than from something to something better. So just get to the end, even if it's trash. Another t- trick people use is write the end scene first. So you kind of know, okay, I'm, I'm getting there, you know, so you don't have this big, you know, uh, wild sort of massive unknown ahead of you, you know, you're going to end on this scene, which you've already written. So I, I would say that I agree with you, the layering and the going back and forth is important, but I also know people who can get stuck in the pattern of writing the first <laughs> 30 to 50 pages and then over and over, uh, just write the rest. I go back to I go back to like that scene or a couple scenes back. I try not to go back all the way to the beginning because if I go away at the beginning, I get caught. And you're right; it's it's like this kind of whirlpool. Exactly. <laughs> that gets you caught. I mean, if you're if you're if you're a good writer or you think you're a good writer, you know that you get you have to work yourself into a place where you're basically taking notes and you're basically getting something. It's not about you creating it; it's about you allowing it. It's doing the kind of grunt work. So that you can kind of deserve actually to get to get what it is. You have to sort of earn it through hard work, if that makes sense. So you so and I think this is I, I believe this completely is when I'm writing, I honestly sometimes I don't even know who's writing. Like I'll just I'll be cha- it's almost channeling, if you will. Yeah. Like something is just like they're talking and it's talking by themselves. And I'm like, OK, I'm just here to write this stuff out. Do you yeah. as you as a writer, do you feel that as well? I think in the best cases, when I, I remember when I was really writing the draft of, of, of Terminal that Spielberg said that he wanted to do, I remember being in a zone for the first time where I, it was just like I was irrelevant. I was just <laughs> in the stream, just kind of servicing whatever this story was that wanted to come through. And it, it's blissful because yes. you're just able to not, you're not responsible for it. You're not the source of it, but you're doing the work, you're earning your place by kind of like servicing, 
you know, your creativity. And it's a, it's a freeing feeling. And actually, when you're starting to write, it's a lot of work and it's horrible and you get headaches and you want to distract yourself with any number of things. But if you just push through, then you reach that time where it's just like, okay, the thing basically is working on its own now. And you just allow it to kind of pull you where it wants to go rather than you determining everything. I think that's the difference. You go from cerebral to kind of creativity being the spirit that pulls you through the thing and gets gets it done. You know, I did not do the best work I've done. Like it comes from somewhere, hopefully. There's some source out there. And I think people who take credit and think that they're geniuses, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I would say that if they're being honest, they know that, you know, they're merely the facilitator, mm -hmm. I think don't think they're the facilitator, then they'll probably have a crash at some point. Anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Write a fucking good script. I mean, it's as simple as that. You'll Put that on a t-shirt, sir. Put that yeah. on a t-shirt. <laughs> it's not as, it's not like having part, you know, going to the right parties and meeting people. There's a certain amount of bullshit that you can do and have the right agent. But at a certain point, your script will find its home if you just focus on the work, just focus on the work, not the bullshit or the trades or, you know, what your what's parents hot, are saying. What's hot, what's when not. You, and don't jump on a bandwagon and don't, you know, just do, try and be you, you know. So I do think these screenwriting courses, I found UCLA massively helpful, you know, the full-time program, uh, but there's also the professional program is fantastic. There are some great teachers in it. You know, go and meet other writers, man. Find your group of people you know, that you respect and trust, work together, support each other, read each other's material, you know, engage, but focus on the material because the material will get the actors, the actors will get the film made, you know, because actors want a great role. So if you're writing, you know, strong roles, you know, you can focus on getting good at that. It will fall into place. That's my feeling. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? I obviously am still learning it. So I don't quite, um, just to be really grateful mm -hmm. for every thing that hap is happening right now, like right now, because that's really all we've got. You know, I've got like right now, I'm really enjoying this chat with you, right? Thank you. The fact, you know, but because as we're doing this, I never really obviously do stuff like this very often. When I'm promoting a film, I'll do an interview. I never really do an in-depth chat or anything like this. So for me, as you're asking me these questions, I'm like remembering all the fighting that I had to, all the fighting I had to do to get all of these films made, to get them seen, to get anyone to be bothered. And it just reminds me that, you know, I just feel lucky and grateful for that. So what I'm saying is right now I'm in that because you're replaying to me all this stuff. You know, I don't think about this stuff. Um, so I think staying present, focusing on the work, I would, I would say, you know, be genuine, be genuine in your dealings with people, be genuine in the emotion you're trying to put on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's being funny, be genuinely funny, like do stuff for you, not because you think other people are going to like it. Yes. What's most authentic to your voice. Like Anvil is a movie that like literally no other person could have made apart from me. My Dinner with Herve is a movie that literally no other person could have made apart from me. What are those stories that are so singular to you and your existence and your experience and what you want to say in the world that you alone must do them. And I think if you're coming from that place, you know, you can just get through a lot of bullshit. You know, life is short, man. We're not here for that long. Mm -hmm. So full on, man. You know, so you may as well go for it and, and don't bullshit around. And also procrastination. I think that's a lesson I could still learn. I still procrastinate. I still, you know, go, well, maybe I'll watch that daytime TV show. It's really fascinating. I really want to learn about haymaking in Flanders in 1765. It's fascinating. No, it's just I'm trying, I don't want to face the pain mm -hmm. of the fact that I am a shit writer who must earn my place at the table every time to become a slightly better writer. You write a really good story. You feel good about it. You go back to beginning, page one's blank. You're total shit again. All that experience is gone. You've got to climb another mountain, and it's just as fucking hard. That's my experience. So don't procrastinate. Still working on it. But um, I would say I probably wasted two full years of watching bad daytime soap operas, <laughs> televisions, game shows, and useless historical programs. Um, and this, so and this, is, pre, and this is pre-Netflix. <laughs> pre-Netflix. I would like to get that. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, what is uh, what did you learn from your biggest failure? Mm. Only work at studios where you like the studio head. <laughs> I won't name who that is. Um, yes, you, you, know, you, you learn. You know, in in the immortal words of Yes keyboardist Rick Wakeman, who played keyboards for Yes, he said, "Success is buried in the garden of failure." And mm-hmm. so I think that's important. By the way, you know we have our special guest. And I'm yes, he'll be, we're 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 gonna we're gonna be there in one second. Give me one second, and we're gonna bring him in. Um, and I'm anxious, and I feel it. And I, I know I can I can feel the energy as well. And we're gonna bring him in in a minute because I just want to okay. finish right off. And last question, sir. Um, yes. Three of your favorite films of all time. Oh my God, With Nail and I. With Nail and I. Have you heard of With Nail and I? Bruce Robinson, genius film. Yes, was, a long time. Yeah, the eight, was that eighties? Yeah, he yes. was Oscar nominated for The Killing Fields. Yes, my yes, first yes, 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 yes. I went to see With Nail and I. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Terribly uncommercial film, one of the most brilliant films of all time, Richard E. Grant. Bruce wrote and directed the film. Mm. If I were to pitch that film, no one would buy it. Two unemployed actors go away to Wales for the weekend. That's the plot of With Nail and I. Okay. And yet, it is absolutely fucking brilliant. Um, Sweet Smell of Success, one of the best scripts ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bert Ancaster, Tony Curtis, Clifford Odets, mm-hmm. Ernest Lehman, um, James Wong Howe is the cameraman. It is Alexander Kendrick yeah. directed it. Mm-hmm. A brilliant so I'd say that. Also, Chinatown. I have to go with Chinatown again. Obviously. So with Nell and I, Sweet Smell of Success, Chinatown. Um, and also Chris Smith's uh, American movie. I love oh, American movie. Oh, my God. So good. And of course, Spinal Tap. Yes. But I will also say Bertolucci's underrated masterpiece, The Last Emperor, won the best Academy Award oh, 87. So good. But if you go back and look at that film, it's unbelievable. I have a 35 millimeter print of it. Um, so those are some of my films. I love the Bond movies, obviously not the Pierce Brosnan period, a little <laughs> bit. Um, but yeah, so stuff like that. Any Jack Tati is fantastic. And all of that Jack Tati stuff made mm-hmm. its way into the original script of Terminal. Um, so, so yeah, those are films, British films. I also love The the Long Good Friday with Bob Hoskins. Yeah, and Helen. yeah with Bob, fantastic, yeah. Fantastic British film. Um, um, Sasha, I, we could, I know we can keep talking for hours about your – you are easily one of the most interesting screenwriters I've ever had on the show. Your adventures are are, are mythical almost in, in, in its way. So Drug fueled. I, I, mean, I mean this is Hollywood. Uh, this so, is <laughs> off drugs, Alex. This huh? is me off drugs. <laughs> exactly. But I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for um, for, for yeah, being man, on the show and dropping another show. We're going to next, right? We are gonna go stuff. right into it. We're going to bring in the special guest next, but I wanted to finish this segment first and give a little bit of a break to everybody. And then Absolutely. they will listen to the next leg- segment after. But thank you, Sasha, so much it's for uh, for being on the show. Thanks, thanks for having me, man. I want to thank Sasha so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe. I truly have had it was just a wonderful wonderful time talking to him and uh getting his his remarkable story on how he's been able to navigate and get into and navigate this business thank you so much sasha don't forget if you want to also listen to the bonus episode where i interview sasha and the lead singer of iron maiden bruce dickinson you can head over to nextlevelsoul.com and check it out there or it should be in your feed here at bulletproof screenwriting. I definitely highly, highly recommend you take a listen to that episode as well. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 118. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 